Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art and culture, and this is Billboard Breakdown. You know, at this point, I'm starting to wonder if I shouldn't have even covered that surprise Drake album. Because if the radio is going to decide to play the entire album, I'm going to end up covering all the songs again anyways. I would say that, except that none of the songs I actually thought were pretty damn great from If You're Reading This It's Too Late have made the Hot 100. I will note this. For as much as many critics hypothesize that there didn't seem to be an easy radio hit off of Drake's new record, not since Taylor Swift have we seen this many album tracks crack the charts. And speaking of her, she's got another single. And even though I reviewed her album, it's not a song that I've heard yet. That's interesting. But of course, before we get to that, we've got our top 10. Lots of surprises here. The first big one being in our top two. I expected Uptown Funk by Mark Ronson and Bruno Mars to get overtaken this week thanks to slowing sales and airplay, but it held up just enough to hold on to the number one slot for one more week. Although I'd argue it was less its strength and more the sudden weakness of Thinking Out Loud by Ed Sheeran, with its softening airplay and getting slightly edged out on streaming and sales. And that shift was courtesy of the sudden powerhouse Love Me Like You Do by Ellie Goulding. At this point, I think its success has to be a confluence of factors. Steady airplay gains, topping streaming, and very strong sales, plus the residual boost of Fifty Shades of Grey that gave it just enough traction to hold on to number three. We're holding back Maroon 5 Sugar, which otherwise could have likely snagged that slot, thanks to consistent gains all across the board. It certainly did a lot better than Take Me to Church by Hosier, which dropped down to number five, which has started its airplay decline at a particularly rough week in sales and in streaming. Another of a drop to prevent four or five seconds by Rihanna, Kanye West, and Paul McCartney from remaining in the top five though. It was pushed back to number six even despite some pretty strong sales, airplay, and YouTube, but not really picking up the streaming that it needed. Blank Space by Taylor Swift holds on to number seven despite some weak sales and steadily dropping airplay, and I predict it's only a matter of time before style unseats it. Saw enough sales, good YouTube, and pretty sizable airplay gains. And now we've got our first new top ten entry, Earned It by The Weeknd. I'll admit to being a little bit surprised here. I thought the Fifty Shades bubble would have been mostly reserved for Ellie Goulding, but sales, streaming, and airplay would prove me wrong here, which is enough to give The Weeknd another top 10 hit to follow off of Love Me Harder. I'll eat with a song that's unfortunately nowhere near as good. And to round out our top 10, Lips Are Moving by Megan Trainer drops a spot to number 10. Weak sales, slowing airplay, low streaming, I predict if there's any strong movements below it next week, it's gone. Now speaking of movements, it was a turbulent week on the chart, so let's start with our losers and dropouts. As expected, did Shotgun Rider by Tim McGraw, Something in the Water by Carrie Underwood, and Heroes We Could Be by Alesso featuring Toflo, they all exit the charts. But the surprise comes through with Ed Sheeran's Don't dropping from 38 straight to the recurring list. It's a pretty steep drop from an otherwise damn great song. I would have thought it stuck around longer. But with a week this busy, it doesn't exactly surprise me. And most of the losers this week fit a series similar bill. Little Red Wagon by Miranda Lambert going to 93. Only One by Kanye West and Paul McCartney slipping to 74. Lay Me Down by Sam Smith dropping to 72. And Chandelier by Sia falling back to 30, these are all evidence of the Grammy bump that's just fading away. And Try Me by DJ Lowe slipping to 90, Sledgehammer by Fifth Harmony continuing its free fall to 87, Talladega by Eric Church still dropping to 80, and The Heart Wants What It Wants by Selena Gomez dropping to 44. These are all songs that the charts are effectively done with at this point. They're on their way out. Now there are a few surprises here though. It seems like Stuck on a Feeling by Prince Royce and Snoop Dogg has stalled out on the charts and fell off to 75, and Blessings by Big Sean and Drake all also took a hit to 68. Although I suspect it'll change the second Big Sean actually drops a video of the full remix of the song with Kanye when the album impacts the charts in about a week or so. The drop that made me the most happy though is Coco by OT Genasis finally starting to fade out to 36. It probably won't be enough to prevent the song from landing on the year end Hot 100, but the less I have to hear of awful trap flavored hip hop in this vein, I'm sorry, that's a good thing. Now the gains on this chart are where things seem to start picking up. For one, as many songs as Drake debuted last week, only three three had significant impact, mostly thanks to streaming. 10 bands rose to 58, Legend went up to 52, and Energy smashed into the top 30 at 26. From there, the other gains following last week, pretty explainable. Ariana Grande's One Last Time goes to 34 because, well, it's Ariana Grande, the video is actually pretty interesting. And What Kind of Man by Florence and the Machine gets a little bit of steam going to 88, which knowing their luck, they'll promptly lose in a week or so, but it's good while it lasts. And then 
then we get the songs that owe their boost thanks to releases this week, with Post to Be by Omerian, Chris Brown, and Janae Aiko rising thanks to the video, and Imagine Dragons' I Bet My Life continuing its wild chart oscillations thanks to some residual gains from Smoke and Mirrors. And finally, you get the songs that are rising actually thanks to some real momentum behind them, with Chains by Nick Jonas surging up to 42, and, for no adequately explained reason, Somebody by Natalie LaRose and Jeremiah breaking the top 30 at 27. Sure, I know it's got a video, but the gains are not stellar across the board, and it still hasn't gotten any more interesting. Ugh, whatever. Let's get to our returning entries, starting with... Yeah, not surprised this is back. It's a pretty good song. Probably got a fair boost from the build-up to the Academy Awards. Watch next week, though. The boost they will get will be probably even bigger. Oh, and if I'm going to talk about the Oscars at all, I will say this. It's absolutely no surprise that this beat out Everything is Awesome, as I said in previous Billboard Breakdown. Even though I do like that song more, and the performance was absolutely wonderful if you actually watched the show. Major props to Common and John Legend, though, for having the balls to get political during their acceptance speeches. They definitely weren't the only ones to do it this year, and really, I should have seen it coming. But in a year where Selma got snubbed as badly as it did. Really, either it or Whiplash should have won Best Picture. Their words were definitely very relevant and well. And overall, pretty damn great song to go along with it. We could take, we could take, we could take a time, baby, in slow motion. Yeah. We could take, we could take, we could take a time, stay here. I am a little surprised that this is back, though. Granted, the release of the video probably has a lot to do with it regaining some traction, but then again, I'm not exactly displeased to see this here. As I said, for a slow burn R&B jam, it's a pretty good song. Only really let down by production that doesn't let the song be as slick, sensual, or an organic as it should be. It does show that Trey songs might be on the right track with finding better production, though, which is definitely a good sign. So, yeah, I'm optimistic. Well, that was surprisingly quick. Now on to our new arrivals, starting with number 100, Go Hard or Go Home by Wiz Khalifa and Iggy Azalea. Okay, when I heard that these two were making a song together with that title, I couldn't help but chuckle. Can you think of two rappers who have less in common than these two? But you know what, thinking about it more, it kind of makes a warped sort of sense. Iggy Azalea is probably looking to find her lane now that her chart presence is effectively gone, and Wiz Khalifa is looking to branch out of his weed rap lane since the disaster that was Black Hollywood. So why not leverage Wiz Khalifa's connections and get another song for the Fast and the Furious series? The sad fact is that when placed in sharp contrast of We Own It with 2 Chains that was out a couple years ago, it's just nowhere near as good, and that's a pretty low bar to set. The majority of the problem is in the beat and the production. The tempo is slower, there isn't as much punch to it, the strings and piano, they're trying to recapture the bombast, but then this thing on the verses, this is gummy horn preset, that just sounds awful. And when you pair it with Wiz Khalifa's sloppy rhyming and Iggy Azalea's better constructed but sloppy punchlines, that proves that she doesn't really understand golf or really has much to do with the Fast and the Furious franchise or cars at all, and more about her verse just being awesome. The song just does not impress me. Even when you consider that this is an obvious cash-in, and it is, for both artists who desperately need a hit to stay relevant, this is a bad song. If it gets any airplay at all, it'll be tied to the movie, not because the track is anything close to good. Next, number 97, Six Man by Drake. Yeah, work the night shift. Young, but I'm making millions to work the night shift. Work. Young, but I'm getting every single motherfucking thing I'm Hey look, folks, we now have five, that's right, five Drake songs to talk about this week. Just for all your reference here, guess how many Drake songs we Canadians got this week on our charts? That's right, one. That gives us a total of two Drake songs in the United States charts, a total of ten. Again, the Canadian charts are always better. But to be fair, at least the U.S. is getting the good Drake songs now, so let's start with Six Man, which honestly I do like. The entire song has a curdled darkness to it that kind of fits with Drake's sing-song flow with off-kilter references, and some of his better bars that it fades into the mournful pianos at the end. And you know what, maybe it's just me, but I actually think the chorus is kind of clever in its subversion. The night shift is rarely ever pleasant, after all, or attracts the attention that it really deserves. So even though that Drake is stacked in cash, it's by slogging away in the murk where he probably doesn't want to be. It's a sludgy, creepy little track, and you know what? I kind of like it. I'll take it. Number 95, Now and Forever by Drake. 
I'm gone, I can't stay here no more And I can't sleep on the floor Man, I'm leaving, I'm leaving You know I got my reasons Yeah, I'm leaving, yeah, I'm leaving Yeah, I'm leaving I'm gone. Now I'm going on the record saying I like more of Drake's R&B side, and this song takes a pretty simplistic concept of Drake's exodus from Cash Money Records and plays it with some damn solid production. The echoing metallic melody, the hazy swirl paired with the hi-hats, Drake's weariness and despair of having to leave what was comfortable into a, the uncertain future. It's really Drake's performance here balanced against this hazy production that makes this song really work for me. He does a really solid job balancing his regret with the necessity of his exit. If it wasn't for the completely unnecessary gunshot sound effect, which really don't fit the song, this probably wouldn't have been one of the best tracks on the album. Still damn good though. Number 83, Six God by Drake. I got one girl, she my girl, and nobody else can hit it. She'll admit it, she'll admit it. She ain't fucking with you niggas. It's just like every single other thing in my life, you can have it when I'm finished. Yeah, okay, it's not 6 p.m. in New York, but for as much as I have issues with some of Drake's rapping, this is one of the better examples. The thicker bass line back against Drake's extended single verse where he actually sounds engaged with his colossal arrogance. He's got a couple solid punchlines that work well enough for what this song is. What doesn't work here is Drake's flow. I'm sorry, but pairing that whole elongated syllable nonsense he does with a very staccato, young thug-inspired delivery it might sound more coherent for Drake than Young Thug, as in I can make out what Drake's saying, but it's an example of him biting other styles rather than defining them, which is a definite disappointment, at least for me. Not a bad song, let me stress this, but nowhere close to the best on that album. Number 81, No Tellin' by Drake. Case they got us all, we never help yeah. I stay up late at night thinking about my life, on a lot, will I get it all? Ain't no tellin', ain't no tellin', yeah. Ain't no tellin', yeah. No tellin'. Now I referenced this song when I reviewed the album, but I didn't discuss it in detail. And to be frank, there's a reason why. It's not one of the better ones. I don't dislike the production, the eerie keyboard line, the thicker bass line, but it's the character that Drake presents is just not remotely attractive. Bringing a knife when he goes to meet up with women, not helping the police for no adequately explained reason, making references to that terrible Tuesday track he did with I Love Matt Conan, dissing other rappers for wearing last season's wardrobe, or really, trying to brag about being the biggest boss after Rick Ross. It was so ridiculously transparent it's just kind of dickish rather than being intimidating or threatening or remotely impressive going with the usual problems that i have with drake's flow even the punchlines that i like on this song just aren't good enough to redeem it i'd pass number 70 know yourself by drake i was running through the six with my wolf you know how that shit go Ah, so this is a song where Drake hopped on Migos' flow and is nearly charting higher than Migos ever did. I don't know whether to be impressed or revolted because this song isn't much better than most Migos tracks. Bragging, a jerky, half-shouted chorus, trap percussion, a very staccato delivery that doesn't sound good at all coming from Drake, and all of it is capped off with the line, I don't like how serious they take themselves. Uh, Drake, if you're intending this to be as a joke or to be more fun, do you want to pick a better melody than this washed out, dreary keyboard line that leeches energy from everything? else around you once again drake is one of the few rappers on the radio who's ever been able to lodge this many songs from an album this quick of a time and yet he's getting there by biting other rappers flows styles and content instead of defining his own and sure you can argue at this point that the album slash mixtape was a throwaway but drake's in the position where even his throwaway tracks will chart and it's an easy way to blow a good reputation when said throwaway tracks land on the charts and they're nowhere near your best and as for this I'd skip it. And finally, number 51, Wonderland by Taylor Swift. lost in it and we pretended it couldn't last forever. It, we found Wonderland. You and I got lost in it and life was never worse but never better. So okay, there's a reason that I actually never covered this song. It was from the deluxe edition of 1989, which I did not review. And like most deluxe edition singles, it's being packaged as a marketing gimmick when it's released now, moving one song at a time from the deluxe only available at Target now to iTunes. And at a start, we've got her fourth single, Wonderland. And while I will say it's better than Shake It Off, it's not by much. For one, if you're imagining what a Taylor Swift modern pop sellout would sound like coming off her country years, Wonderland, it would be it. Way too percussion heavy for what is actually 
pretty good tinkling melody with fragments of guitars, that abusive reverb, and that crushing leaden bass drop that does absolutely nothing to evoke images of Wonderland. Yes, even the Tim Burton version. Now, to give her credit, Taylor Swift works her ass off to save the song with her exaggerated theatrical delivery and lyrics that play off the whole adventure into Wonderland as an obvious metaphor for a crazy relationship. Honestly, done pretty well here. But what, did we really need that stuttered AA chorus that feels swallowed up by that pummeling drop? In other words, it's a bonus track that's being pushed as a single. And as such, it's one of her weakest and most forgettable singles from 1989 to date. There are better songs she could have used here. Skip it. So yeah, that's our list. Really, I'm not left with a lot of choices here for best and worst of the week. Well, worst is pretty easy. Go Hard and Go Home by Wiz Khalifa and Iggy Azalea easily takes that, with no telling by Drake right behind it for a dishonorable mention. But for the best? See, there's a part of me here that doesn't want to give the top to Glory, given how it was so obviously marketed for the Academy Awards. But that ignores the fact that it is a genuinely powerful song. Not as sharp and common or John Legend's best, but it does have a certain majestic swell to it that's kind of hard to deny. Beneath it, Drake's probably going to snag that honorable mention this week for now and forever. Not the best on this album for sure, but you know what? I'll take what I can get. Let's only hope that next week we don't have another episode of The Drake Show here. Granted, knowing my luck, we'll just get an onslaught of Big Sean on, and that's probably worse. But until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Billboard Breakdown on Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.